Hello, it's Randy Rhodes. Here's a clip from our show and go to randyrhodes.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast. Mary had a little man, man, man. The fault. We believe that all men are created to the magnificent mosaic that is America. From radio beacon to radio beacon. Change has come to America. Believe me. Knock, knock. Who's there? It's hey! a figment of your imagination. Randy Roach. Turn up your mind. The President Trump should not be impeached, even if all the evidence and arguments laid out by the House are accepted as fact. That's right. Uh, <laughs> when you have somebody who, for example, is indicted for a crime, let's assume you have a lot of evidence, but the grand jury simply indicts for something that's not a crime, and that's what happened here. You have a lot of evidence, disputed evidence, could go both ways, but the vote was to impeach on abuse of power, which is not within the constitutional criteria for impeachment, and obstruction of Congress. Uh, those are both the kinds of things that led Hamilton and Madison, uh -huh. talk about nightmare, mm -hmm. to regard that as the greatest nightmare. Uh, number one, giving Congress too much power uh, to allow the president to serve at the will of Congress. And number two, as Hamilton put it, the greatest danger is turning impeachment into a question of who has the most votes in which house and rather than having a consensus and a broad a broad view of impeachable conduct. The brief. All right. So Alan Dershowitz says abuse of power was not considered a high crime misdemeanor uh, or anything that is removable. He quotes Hamilton. He's quoting the Federalist Paper, number 65, which if you go to randyroads.com and click on the homework section, it's there. I put it in there. I also put in Federalist 33 if you're more of a Madisonian, because uh, he talks about it too. But Hamilton, number 65. That is the uh, discussion that was had about the judicial character of the Senate and what the pitfalls would be if they gave the Senate the power to try impeachments. And, of course, there's a discussion in there about who should try impeachments. They considered the Supreme Court as being the trier of impeachments, and they rejected that because they said it should be a body with uh, more than nine members. OK, it should be, a you know, you've got 100 people or well, back then you didn't. But now you have 100 people in the Senate. They believe that the more, the better. So they gave the trier of impeachments to the Senate. And, and he understood that this was going to be a difficult thing. But he laid out what is removable. He said, this is the argument for why it's difficult to give the House or the Senate power over the executive branch. And it's because they're all elected, right? And they would all be concerned about their reelection. I mean, these were not idiots, these founding fathers, okay? And he said, a well-constituted court for the trial of impeachments is an object not more to be desired than difficult to be obtained in a government wholly elected. The subjects of its jurisdiction are those whose offenses which proceed from the misconduct of public men. In other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. They relate chiefly to injuries done immediately to the society itself. The prosecution of them for this reason will seldom fail to agitate the passions of the whole community and divide it into parties more or less friendly or in inimical to the accused. In many cases, it will connect itself with the pre-existing factions, parties, and will enlist all their animosities, partialities, influence, and interest on one side or another. And in all such cases, there will always be the greatest danger that the decision will be regulated more by the comparative strength of the parties than by the real demonstrations of innocence or guilt. But the delicacy and the magnitude of a trust which so deeply concerns the political reputation and the existence of every man engaged in the administration of public affairs speaks for itself. So he's saying... Yeah, you're always going to have trouble because 
if we gave it, you know, we gave the House uh, the indictment, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the uh, power to indict. That's called impeachment. And then we gave the Senate the power to try. And yeah, it's going to rip a country apart. That's why Nancy Pelosi said impeachment is, is, is something she doesn't do lightly because it tears the country apart. That's what everybody understands and knows. But he also says that there is a delicate and gigantic trust that goes into people who make the public laws and people who execute the public laws. So great is that responsibility that they have to stand and be questioned if there's any abuse of their official office. And that's what they discuss. And he said, you know, in the Constitutional, he talks about the Constitutional Convention. And he says, you know, and he makes fun of it. He says, the convention, it appears, thought the Senate the most fit depository of this important trust. Those who can best discern the intrinsic difficulty of the thing will be least hasty in condemning that opinion and will be most inclined to allow due weight to the arguments which may be supposed to have produced it. And then he talks about why didn't we give it to the Supreme Court? Why didn't we give it to the Supreme Court? And he says because it's too big of a job for too small a group. You need to give it to the Senate. It's an imperfect solution, but it's the best one we have. And that's why I keep telling you, America is a contract. It is an agreement. It is a simple agreement of the co-equal branches of government to do the things that are written down in the Constitution for all its flaws and all its inability uh, to remove elected politics from these important breaches of public trust and abuse. It's difficult. Everybody knew it would tear the country apart. Everybody understood it was difficult. But he goes on to say, look, we took this from Great Britain. We took it from English law. The House of Commons preferred the impeachment and the House of Lords decided on it. And he said several of the state constitutions, they adopted this principle too. And so we look at the Senate as a bridal in the hands of a legislative body upon the executive. A bridal, like a, you know, a horse bridal. And when the executive abuses his public trust, when the executive abuses his, his office, then the best cure we have is to have a trial in the Senate. And that's, that, you know, everybody, you know, and, and, and what's really sick, they don't want witnesses. They don't want witnesses. All right, so let me, let me, let me play you um, uh, Ken Starr's 1998 appearance. This is, uh, you know, uh, like uh, two minutes. Do we have time for this now? No. All right, so we'll take the break. I'll play it on the other side. So on the other side, you're going to hear a clip of, of Ken Starr from 1998. And he's going to talk about these assertions of privilege that Bill Clinton asserted for himself uh, not to testify in front of a grand jury. And, of course, that went to the Supreme Court. Whether or not Bill Clinton had to te- And, by the way, here's what we were talking about in the case of Bill Clinton. We were talking about pre-presidential behavior... Right. The Paula Jones case is the civil case in which Bill Clinton sought not to testify when he became president. So it was pre-presidential behavior that was uh, being looked at. Bill Clinton asserted uh, executive privilege and said the president doesn't have to testify in a civil suit because he's the president and the president is very busy, right, doing the work of the people. And they took this all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court unanimously decided, no, you're not that busy. You can put a few hours aside and you can show up and be sworn and testify in the Paula Jones matter. Ken Starr said the assertion of that privilege in and of itself was an abuse of power. Now, you know, the president has instructed every cabinet member, every witness, every aide not to testify about presidential conduct while he was president in Congress and produced zero documents. Bill Clinton, in the end, not only testified in front of the Paula Jones uh, civil uh, lawyers, but also in front of the grand jury, and he provided his freaking DNA. Go to 
Cody Rhodes.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast.